Hello and welcome to this Conversations with Dr. Bachner. This is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. And I'm here with Preeti Milani, who is a, a very special person. She really is wonderful. She's an Associate Editor at JAMA in Infectious Disease. She's Chief Health Officer and a Professor of Medicine at Michigan Medicine Infectious Diseases, uh, obviously University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Welcome, Preeti. Thank you. And Preeti is the first person, along with Carlos Del Rio, since I've been at JAMA, to have a triptych. So what's a triptych? A triptych is, so far, three articles. We're trying to figure out if she has a fourth, what it means. The first was February 28th, COVID-19, new insights on a rapidly changing epidemic. March 17th, 2019, novel, uh, novel coronavirus, important information for clinicians. And one that we just published uh, earlier this morning, COVID-19 pandemic in the U.S., a clinical update. Preeti, before we start, could you say a little bit about uh, Saad and Carlos, your two co-authors on this piece? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Howard. Thanks for having me. And my, my co-authors are amazing. Uh, Carlos Del Rio is really well-known in infectious disease and public health. And, you know, I remember you asked me to put, put together um, a, a piece uh, during Super Bowl weekend. And and I was thinking, like, there's no way I can do this. And I knew the one person who would be able to help me and drop everything he was doing was Carlos. And so that was wonderful. And then Saad is also uh, deeply involved in public health. He's now the head of global health at Yale. And he is uh, his background is in infectious disease and vaccines. And we, we brought him in this time. So, yeah, this is a, a, a great joint effort. So we're going to go through some of the really... Uh, important topics uh, that have emerged over the last two or three weeks, uh, case fatality rate, PCR, obviously touch on mass. But let's just start with case fatality. That's always the big yeah. number. And I pulled uh, this off the uh, Oxford COVID-19 website this morning. I'll just read some of the case fatality rates that they're uh, publishing, and then you and I can talk a little bit about how some of these may not be as accurate as people that had hoped. So um, the UK, uh, 9.45, Spain, 9.29, France, 9.11. Sweden, which has taken a very different approach, yeah. interestingly yeah. enough, has crept yeah. up over the last few days, 5.84. Uh, Denmark, 3.70. Switzerland, 2.51. The US, they list as 2.55. Um, uh, Japan, 2.41. Uh, South Korea has moved from 0.5 to 1.73. And Germany uh, has also increased from below point uh, below one to one point three four. Pre Preeti, what can you say about the case fatality rate? Yeah, so the case fatality rate, which is, as the name sounds, the number of, of deaths uh, per cases, and you know, this is interesting because there's a there's a clearly an ascertainment issue, and we are in the United States and probably in most of the world picking up only like the tip of the iceberg in terms of the serious cases. That present, and I think the exception is Korea, where there was a really aggressive uh, campaign to go out and test and isolate. But um, I can speak for Ann Arbor. Uh, unless you are really sick, you're coming into our emergency department or being hospitalized, you're probably not going to get a test unless you might be a healthcare worker or you fall into some other high risk category. So if you look at the original data from Wuhan, and the case fatality rate was quite high then. And some of it was because of infrastructure issues. And we all remember the photos of they were building like a 6,000 bed hospital yeah. and within days. And that just seemed uh, really surprising, but it doesn't seem so surprising now when we see uh, what's happened in our own system. But you know, I, I do think the case fatality rate is gonna be quite a bit lower. And also the raw number is not particularly meaningful because it's different for different people. Uh, and we, right. we keep hearing about older adults, but it's there's also some other risk factors that are probably driving it. But we it'll be a long time before we really know the true fa case fatality rate. But regardless, it is higher than a lot of uh, seasonal flu, respiratory virus, and it's certainly higher than anything we would want to see. Yeah, I think clearly, you know, it's interesting. People look at these intra uh, these country comparisons, but the reality is they reflect many other things. Yeah. capacity in each country, the age distribution, other risk factors in the country. But I know we do pay uh, quite a bit of attention uh, to them. L let's move on to some of the other clinical issues. And, and why, don't, why don't we start with the one that I think has really changed so dramatically over the weekend. So on February 21st, uh, JAMA published a 
a research letter, presumed asymptomatic carrier transmission of COVID-19. Um, it had followed other reports. This one was probably a bit better done than some of the other reports that had been published. And then sometime in early April, uh, the CDC announces that people should generally wear masks, yeah. uh, in part because of asymptomatic transmission and some other issues. Um, what's your sense of, of masks? We had gotten many viewpoints comparing Asian countries to the U.S. Why weren't we wearing masks in the U.S.? And then this you know, sea change over the last few days. Uh, how do you reflect on this story of masks just over the last six, eight weeks, Preeti? Yeah, the story has has changed a lot. This is a full 360. And in fact, our first viewpoint that Carlos and I wrote, and it was consistent with what everyone was saying, which is you don't need a mask. And in fact, wearing a mask is going to, you're going to get it dirty and you're going to contaminate your face and leave the masks for the healthcare workers. But really the recommendation has evolved. And if you walk around at least Ann Arbor now, you'll see people wearing particularly homemade uh, cloth masks. And, and you know, these data are, they, they are reflective of the point you made around asymptomatic spread. And I have to say one of the biggest surprises to me in, in this, because I still, it's a respiratory virus. And how is it spread? And how much of a role does asymptomatic spread have? And if it's a huge role, I have to believe that our denominator is, is, is gigantic um, and that we haven't picked it up yet. And particularly in a place like China, uh, it is interesting because culturally in places like China, people have worn masks now for a number of years. And some of it is around air pollution that they wear the masks. And so right. it's become part of part of the tradition. If you travel through Asia, you see this. Um, and there, they, data in, um, in Taiwan and Singapore also suggested that masks were helpful. And at this point, uh, the recommendation for the public is really around that, that notion of asymptomatic spread and um, really containing people's secretions a bit. Uh, particularly in public areas where it might be hard to socially distance. And, you know, what's changing too in, in the hospital setting, at least in some hospitals that have adequate resources, is that universal masking with the surgical mask is also changing. And that is something that in the last couple of weeks has gotten picked up. I think even a month ago, if we had said, gee, let's put a mask on everyone, we would have said, no, why, why should you do that? And we're doing it at my hospital. I know a lot of other hospitals are. And it's that notion of uh, really... Uh, protecting the rest of the world from you. Right. I was going to ask. So that's what you're doing with it. So say I had uh, I, I was uh, I had been infected. I was asymptomatic for the first few days. I go into my grocery store to shop by wearing yeah. a mask. I'm protecting other people. Correct. That is correct. That um, is correct. Yeah. I, I know. Um, you know. The president said it was optional and chose not to wear it. I, I think you and I would both be comfortable urging everyone, particularly if you go into stores or you have anywhere near close contact with people for people to wear masks. Yeah. And, and it, it's really creative, like the kind of masks that people have. And, you know, I noticed as I, w I did some grocery shopping yesterday and really it was a, a, a complete change from the last few weeks. Uh, I think outdoors, you know, it's a little different in terms of how far apart you are and how transmission happens, but uh, it, it's an easy thing to do. There's not really a downside to it, and particularly if you're not taking supplies away from the healthcare setting. Right. I think that's critical. So I wouldn't want anyone to begin to buy masks and then uh, deplete the supply that was available for healthcare workers. Um, but but it, it is interesting uh, how much this has changed in a short period of time. And as yeah. I said, I, I can imagine when eventually businesses begin to open, mask wearing may be pretty common for the next few months. It might be a good uh, jam tchotchke for next year. Oh, right? That's like good. That. I like that. <laughs> um, lots about PCR. The Boston Globe you, you know, had a piece about false negative rates being 30% early on. Many different reasons. I, I think uh, it can be confusing. One, was the sample obtained correctly? Yes. Secondly, does someone have... An, enough viruses in them for the PCR to be uh, uh, positive. And then secondly, was the PCR, the physical test, done correctly? Um, this is a complicated issue. I, I think less so for people who are going to stay home. They may have to be quarantined and retested yep. if we ever get to that period. Much more critical in the hospital. So could you talk a bit about PCR and positivity, sensitivity, and what's happening at U Michigan? Yeah, sure. So the PCR test, in, there are a number of different platforms and a number of sort of homegrown uh, 
test in the sense that like, and, and Michigan is a place that has done this in order to have adequate capacity, our, our lab directors, our pathologists, uh, they've, they've developed their own PCR that's been validated. And if anything, I think our test is really, really sensitive. And uh, we can talk about that notion later, but uh, we're, you know, we're not checking tests to clear people. In general, we're, we're basing it on symptoms for healthcare workers, but we have not seen a lot of uh, false negatives at this time. I'm not sure what was happening early on, you know, when it was really limited, even to get a test was was difficult. Uh, clearly the sample is important and, and getting that nasopharyngeal sample, getting it really far back and, and uh, having the right technique is important. But uh, we, we're not seeing that at this time it, and it is, something that is evolving. There are a number of commercial labs that are now doing testing. Some of the issues around testing too are just turnaround time. And that that is a difficult thing. And that was part of why we went to the system that we did where we can get the results now within a, within a few hours. And we're not at like point of care five minutes yet, but uh, you know, I think it has evolved fast from like several days to just um, within a day. Um, and we're we're using the test as and, and considering it to be quite uh, sensitive. Okay. Um, uh, the next section in the viewpoint, and uh, again, you discuss this in the first two reports, but still remains a, uh, an issue. And then I'd like to follow up with some questions about serology because it goes with yeah. this one. Can patients become reinfected? Yeah. So part of the answer is we're not totally sure, but we have some data to suggest that it is unlikely. I know there were some reports. There, were, I saw them in the media. I don't think I saw any peer-reviewed publications. Certainly, I didn't see anything in JAMA about this notion of reinfection, where people were in the hospital, they had a positive test, they turned negative, and then they came back with more symptoms, and they were positive. And is this a reinfection? Um, and these are again, they're news stories, so you have to, I think, take them with with a little bit of a measure. Um, there's some reasons to think that that is unlikely to be true, particularly because it's unclear how testing is done and was it a false negative in, be in between and did the test just persist positive. Uh, there is a, an interesting study and we cite it in our viewpoint and it's, it's a preprint and it's a macaque study okay. where they, I think it was four macaques and they infected the macaques and they had like, you know, fevers and weight loss and some symptoms of, of, of COVID infection. And then they, uh, they actually got exposed again and they didn't develop infection. Now, you know, this is a small sample, but it's a, it is a primate that's used actually in a lot of vaccine development. And so the suggestion is, is that it's probably unlikely. And we also have some information from, uh, from SARS-1. And again, another coronavirus and that there likely is a production of neutralizing antibodies. Um, and we could talk a little bit about serology and where that might where that might uh, come into play here. Yeah, that's a question that's come through. And I'd like to stop for, uh, and pause and talk about serology because yeah. uh, I think it may play a, a much more important role, hopefully, as the pandemic wanes and we sort out what, what to do at the population level uh, in the future. But could, So could you talk a little bit about serology? How do, how do infectious disease physicians think about it in terms of trying to understand what has happened to someone who may or may not have been infected? So one of the biggest questions to me, Howard, clinically, is just this whole spectrum of disease. Like we, we sort of know what the extreme and the severe right. disease looks like, and we're seeing that. And, and unfortunately, we're, you know, we are seeing some people um, do very poorly and die, but we don't have a sense of like what mild disease looks like. And part of it is because we're not testing widely. And frankly, if someone isn't having symptoms, they may not end up with a positive test by the PCR regardless. And it's not an indication to just sort of test people asymptomatically. It would be a low priority. So that gives us serology. And there are some early data from China uh, that look at these. It, it, it's interesting. You know, they look at these sort of like possible, probable, definitive uh, cases. And then they look at IgM and IgG. And, and they see the, the increase, like what you would expect around five days on average for IgM and around 20 days for IgG. And again, it's consistent with what we see with a lot of viral infections. Right. And, you know, that to me is a really interesting thing because first of all, if we're going to assume that it indicates immunity and at this point, there's probably reasonable, it, it's, it's a reasonable assumption 
And we could talk about whether that is or isn't. And we, you know, time will tell. But particularly in the healthcare setting, let's say that you have people, or in the daycare setting, or in the education setting, let's say you have someone that you know is immune, or living in a residence hall for that matter. You know, do you do you pair zero negative, zero positive people? I mean, this sounds sort of um, impossible right now, but I I think some of these discussions are are being had, and I understand in Italy they're actually looking at this. Right. No, uh, my understanding is in Germany the goal is for them to understand the serology status of virtually every single person who lives in the country as they prepare oh. to move forward. That that it will help them make decisions. I mean, you can imagine. You know, there's been a lot of healthcare workers who have been infected. If they maintained high levels of IgG as we move uh, into the fall, they may be uh, uh, better assigned to work with patients who are p possibly COVID infected because they themselves will be protected. Preeti, do you know the data about how long with SARS-1 people maintain protective levels? Or is that, I'm, sh I'm sure we need more data about this pandemic, but yep. do people maintain in, uh, high enough IgG levels to, to be protected for weeks to months or years? Is, is there enough data to know that? There, there are some data from SARS-1. And, uh, and again, we're just too early in, in our uh, pandemic and this outbreak to, to understand that. But the feeling is from SARS-1, the peak was around four months and that immunity lasted two or three years in people. So that's a pretty good timeline in terms of thinking about vaccines and other therapeutics. Right. If Eventually, if we don't have tests on everyone, we draw serology on large segments of the population. We'll actually know how many people had asymptomatic, well, uh, 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 essentially had asymptomatic disease because they'll yep. tell us, were you sick or not? And they'll say no, but their serology will indicate that they had been infected. I just spoke to someone who I work with today who who you know has had a mild illness for a, a week or ten days? She's quite uh, convinced that uh, you know she she was infected. But the only way to know know to yep. know now is for her to have serology. Yeah, I think it'll be really interesting a month from now in New York City or a couple months from now to if you just did a serum survey. And we used to do this in the '80s and '90s with HIV just to get a sense of like what the prevalence might be in a in a community. You know, just with leftover serum. So I, I hope that some of those studies are being done. Um, there's been quite a bit written now about uh, how, how the organism is spreading. I, I think some of this is nomenclature. T to me, droplets or aerosolized is a complicated concept. Uh, at Livingston, you know, uh, we recruited this study from MIT that was published uh, uh, two or three weeks ago, uh, actually last week, about how far droplets spread. But it was also based upon the size of the droplet. And I guess this notion of how far it could spread three feet or six feet is 50 years old. But, but uh, could you explain the, uh, the droplet versus the aerolized? And is it really distinct or is it really kind of a spectrum of potential spread? Yeah, no, this is this is a great question. And I think this is one that the infectious disease community is is, is pretty interested in. And you know, I would say the easy answer is it's likely a spectrum. I don't think it's a binary issue of like, this is droplet and then this is airborne. And you know, most respiratory infections are droplet. And most respiratory infections are spread person to person through respiratory secretions through droplet. And you know, this has been interesting in that there's also this notion of like, well, the environment playing a role and asymptomatic spread. And, you know, it used to be just, oh, well, make sure no one coughs on you. And then now it's become, you know, a much, much bigger issue. And we're still learning that. Uh, that that study was fascinating. I Like the gas cloud right. study. Um, and it, it is interesting because it, as, as I recall, it was not so much that things like were airborne and went for you know, feet and feet. It's just like they kind of traveled in a cloud and, and ended up settling. Right. And so the spread could be greater. And again, I think it gets at issues around aerosolized, aerosol, aerosol generating procedures, which is like a big issue clinically. Right. Uh, and the big, the big difference would be like, do you use an N95 mask or a surgical mask and how much of a difference is there? And bottom line is we don't have enough N95s right now. We're reprocessing them. We're looking at ways to preserve them which was unthinkable, you know, six months ago. And you know, certainly with TB and other infections, we, we, we like to use the N95, uh, a fitted N95, but 
we're finding that the surgical masks are pretty good if, if they're used properly. But when, uh, when I'm wearing a mask outside or I go to the grocery store and I'm wearing a mask and I'm trying to protect other people um, and I'm not coughing or sneezing, I don't, I don't think anyone would risk coughing or sneezing in public now. I'm, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think people would know they'd be a, a pariah pretty quickly. You get uh, run out of town. Yeah. And so, so I'm protecting both against droplet, right? Like I sneeze and a droplet goes a, a certain distance. But um, I'm also protecting people from what would be my uh, oral secretions being yep. aerosolized, correct? It's, it's protecting that, that both is. types. Right? That is my understanding. It, it, it does help on both and sort of helps contain some of that that would normally just be out. And you can see too in grocery stores, they have like the, the shields, the, you know, the plexiglass and you know, we're, we're, start, we're, we're doing what they do in Asia. Right. We're, we've caught up with them. Yeah. The other question, every time I, I, I do a live stream with Tony, they always say, well, how long does the organism live on my mail or my packages? Because so yeah. many people. So Tony, Tony kind of avoided the question. He said, you don't have to worry about anything coming from China. Well, not many things at that point were coming from China. And that yeah. took that would still on a boat take weeks. But the Amazon package or your grocery delivery or your Peapod, if you can get it, comes the next day. And I had a, a, a discussion with one of my relatives. Could he read the newspaper? It was coming in a plastic wrap. Yeah. I, I don't have a sense that people need to be that concerned or skittish, but I don't, I don't recall reading much data about it. There had been a, a report in a, in a couple journals about how long the organism lives, but that's very different than whether or not uh, uh, people can, can, can get the organism. And again, you're supposed to wash your hands. So I assume if you pick up the package and wash your hands, you'll generally be okay. I guess one could argue you could go back to the package and reinfect your hands. But do you have a sense about mail or packages or grocery deliveries? Yeah, so this is this is a great question. And I think it's one that, in, in my opinion, has probably been emphasized a little too much. And you know, I agree with the comments you've made. I think being thoughtful and smart and washing your hands, uh, this idea of the fomites and how much of a role they have and that days later uh, they could be causing uh, infection, I feel is unlikely. You know, if you took something, it was heavily contaminated, and then you rubbed your eye or your nose or your mouth, in theory, you could infect yourself. But, you know, hopefully none of us are doing that. We're being careful about stuff. Um, the um, Although there's viability of virus, I'm not sure that there's infectivity, and those are different. And there was a lot of, like, around some of the cruise ships, and, of course, like, the whole place was contaminated. But people weren't necessarily picking up infection just because there there were traces of a virus there. And, you know, that's I, I think if it's that contagious, I have to believe that our denominator is huge. Right. When we do serology of the 320 yeah. million Americans, and I would think that 150 would have 150 million would yeah. have protective serology, yeah. um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, everyone is, you know, anxious you know, and so I, I think because of the anxiety, anything we read and the media have really covered this extensively. And I would say in general, the coverage has been very, very good. And at least in what I read. Um, but I, I think then people get really anxious. There's a lot of questions. Can we go through them, Preeti? Do you sure, have time? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, sometimes I don't get to them and some of them are funny. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, but they they think one of the cats at one of the zoos has gotten infected. Yeah. I'm sure you were, I mean, it was on the front page of a few newspapers. Do you, do you have any sense of what that means? Yeah. I, I heard it was like the tiger at the Bronx Zoo or something. Yeah. And my first question was, how did a tiger get a test? <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I didn't read the story, but I understand the tiger was, was coughing. And you know, it's really kind of interesting because I think about the macaque model also. That clearly, you know, primates can, can get some kind of infection. Um, but then I also think about all the individuals who have cats and dogs at home. And, you know, I'm not hearing that cats and dogs are getting sick. Um, animals sort of respond differently to coronavirus. Coronaviruses are common in animals. And in fact, this one, that's it's a zoonotic infection. Uh, I think it's it's interesting. You know, I, I don't, you know, all the zoos are closed right now. But like, are we going to get to the point where we can't go to the zoo because we're worried about, about spreading infection? I don't know. It, it, it seems like a one-off to me more than like a, a systemic problem. Okay. Uh, 
the quarantine for 14 days, you know, early on, uh, uh, quite a few of the journals uh, reported, you know, uh, uh, viruses in stool out 28 days, you, you know, and, and, you know, and you already mentioned that rather than retesting, you're saying seven days from being well, which is the CDC recommendation. They changed it a few weeks ago. Um, still comfortable with a quarantine of, you know, 14 days. I, I know a lot of states, since they can't close their highways, are saying if people come from out of state, you're to quarantine for 14 days. Is that generally the consensus in the infectious disease community? Yeah, I mean, we can talk about whether that would really work state to state. But but I if, I, if you look at the early information from China, the average, and it was in one of the viewpoints that Carlos and I did early on, the average age, average time of onset was really five to six days. And then, of course, people sort of progressed. And 14 days seemed like a reasonable time period. And to me, it still feels reasonable. I know there have been these case reports of someone developing symptoms further out, but I also think it's hard to know when you're exposed in the setting of so much community exposure, unless you really are completely isolated. Uh, so even knowing like when you were exposed and when you got sick, it's tough, but 14 days feels like a reasonable amount of time with a respiratory virus to me. You were intimately involved in our decision to publish the very limited case series from China on convalescent plasma, yeah. uh, which uh, has become uh, quite well read. It has a high alt metric score. It's got a lot of press. Uh, and interesting, it's already reaching clinical treatment in certain areas. I hope it's being done with some experimental design so we can understand if it if it works. There's quite a few questions about it. I mean, it's so time honored. It's, it, we've we've done it for a hundred years. A, a sense of if it will work, not work. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that it'll work because I I'm not sure that we're going to have an antiviral or other treatment that's going to going to work that on a, on a, that can, that's available on a large scale. Uh, it's a really interesting case series. It's five cases, as I recall, and it was very preliminary. And it was people who were critically ill in China, and they received convalescent serum, and they did well. They they now did they were they have gotten better on their own? It's hard to say. So this begs for a randomized trial. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, it's it's also like I, I think we have to be a little bit flexible. And, and the whole ethics around randomization uh, are getting are, are getting blurred <laughs> in some places. But, you know, I hope that we can, you know, through some thoughtful design and you know, people like Derek Angus and others um, to do this. But I as I and, you know, it may end up being like a cluster randomized thing because some places aren't doing it. And if you can match patients a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting. I, Mount Sinai announced a program, uh, and uh, apparently they had uh, Mount Sinai in New York had quite a few uh, people who volunteered. Uh, mm -hmm. to provide uh, their uh, their blood and then their plasma and serum so that uh, other people could get it. I mean, it is a time-honored approach. I, I mean, there's so many clinical trials. I mean, people have suggested 300 are uh, ongoing. I think most of our listeners would probably know it. You know, a, a very successful drug would, and for the seriously ill, would reduce mortality by 20%. That's that's all. There's not going to be a drug out there that reduces mortality in half. That would be just extraordinary, and there's no yeah. reason to think that would be true. And and so even uh, a, a not a prevention trial, but a treatment trial, will will certainly, if successful, reduce mortality. But it, it's not likely to be a, a huge uh, reduction. I, I wrote Austin Carroll this morning. He had a wonderful. Uh, article in the New York Times about 18 months ago about number needed to treat. It's such a difficult concept for people. So you have a successful trial, a really good number needed to treat would be 10, which means nine people ha have to be treated for one to benefit. It's a very difficult concept for people. Yeah. And, you know, in a, in a sense, all of this is, is, is buying time and trying to, to prevent really poor outcomes with the hope that a vaccine will be the end game. Yeah, and I know, you know, there's, this, you know, Tony's gone through it as of other people. This phase one's already been announced, but, but you know, flu vaccines often aren't that effective. Yes. I mean, it, it varies from year to year. Um, it's not, not clear to me that a vaccine around uh, coronavirus would be that much more effective than it is it, it, it against flu. So uh, it, it's going to take a number of different approaches. Um, when you read, 
read through what we publish, other journals, the literature. Is there anything striking to you, Preeti, that, that I mean, I before we went on, I, I said, you know, I've been so disturbed by the rates of infection among healthcare workers. It, it's so disturbing. I, I mean, you know, they're, they're risking their lives. They don't have the right uh, protection oftentimes. Then they go home. Their families are at risk. They, they end up leaving the workforce. Um, what's striking you uh, through this pandemic? I mean, you're watching it up close. You consult. You take care of patients. What's striking to you? Yeah, so the, the, there, there are a lot of things. And just to comment on the healthcare worker piece, uh, certainly in China and Italy, you know, we've, it, it's, it's been well documented in these you know, tragic losses of, of, you know, in some cases quite young healthcare workers and you know, all these theories around why that might have happened or not happened. In the United States, it's not clear. Uh, the early experience from Seattle, from University of Washington, is, is that they didn't see a lot of transmission. And in fact, they sort of changed their guidance, which we followed, uh, by saying, even after an exposure, we're not going to quarantine you because they wouldn't have anyone left to take care of patients. Um, it may be a very different city, situation in New York. And, you know, I'm watching it more from, um, from on TV and, and seeing people lack PPE, uh, which is which is really a difficult thing because you can't just sort of make it in your in your garage. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the issues that I, I think is worth thinking about is whether there's an ascertainment bias uh, in that. We're testing healthcare workers a lot because it's important that they're not infected and seeing patients. So it might be that we're just picking up ah. community spread, or it could be that they are getting exposed. And there there have been some well documented situations where an entire office has been been exposed. So I, you know, I think it the thing that strikes me, Howard, is that how little we know about this situation that it's changed the the history of the world. Yeah, it is striking to me. You know, we publish a lot. I, I always wonder, you know, what's the impact of what journals publish? Uh, you, you know, we've published some good science, as have other journals. But it's interesting. Our approaches are time honored. There's been no unique approaches um, uh, that have been developed just for this. They, they've they gone back to what we've always known about infectious agents, be they bacterial or viral. Uh, it, it, it is interesting to me. Uh, uh, quite a few questions about treatment. I have jokingly said I, I, I'm disappointed I hadn't kept all of the queries, viewpoints I had about try this, try that. I, I must have received 50 or 75 um, uh, viewpoints. Try vitamin C, try vitamin D, try this antiviral agent, try that antiviral agent. Uh, this morning I sent it on to Derek. Someone said, that they thought high fever would be curative and that we shouldn't treat fever. So many, many different options. Um, any inkling of what may work or not, or you really want to see the data, Preeti? C certainly I want to see the data, but we don't have time to, to wait fully. Uh, one thing that our group has done is we've moved away from uh, the antimalarial hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we, we were doing it pretty routinely and we were seeing toxicity. GI side effects and liver toxicity. And so uh, it's kind of case by case now, but in general, we have moved away from that. Uh, we have a couple, we're involved in a couple of the remdesivir trials. Right. So again, those are people that um, in the, they have to qualify and there, there are some things that let that exclude people. Uh, but, but I think that's, it'll be interesting to see. Again, the drug was developed for a different reason and will it be helpful or not? The, the one place that we've seen some optimism, and again, it's in patients who are doing poorly, are the IL-6 uh, inhibition. Uh, uh, and, and again, you don't want to give that to everyone. There's some real downsides to that. And you have to be declining rapidly to, to, to qualify for it. So are we really changing the course or are we supporting people and they're, and they're getting better? Uh, we are selecting for people who we think might do better, like the extremes of age, um, someone who is older uh, might not qualify. But again, it, it, we're, we're treating it like a scarce resource to yeah, some that, extent, but that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, that's a side of kind storm that's come across exactly. my desk also. So antivirals, this chloroquine question, you know, as an evidence-based person, that's, that's how I grew yeah. up in my training. I cringe, cringe a bit when someone says, well, I'm not really a doctor, but it feels right, sounds good to me, why don't you give it a try? 
Because in the back of my mind, you know what Andrew Khalil had written for us is, look, if the patient does well, you assume it was that drug. If the patient does poorly, you assume uh, uh, it was the disease without recognizing you could be creating an enormous number of side effects with patients. Exactly. And, and I think that's what uh, makes people so anxious uh, about it. A um, couple other questions, and then I know you really wanted to talk a little bit about uh, post-acute care and society in general. Yeah. Uh, social distancing, how long will it go on for? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, well, it can't go on forever. Um, and it becomes hard to sustain over time. And, you know, I have to say people in Ann Arbor are doing pretty well considering, you know, this has become our way of life. We've adopt, ad adopted it pretty well. Uh, you know, Scott Gottlieb had a really thoughtful this monograph that you might have seen last week. And I thought that was really helpful. It helped. And I've shared it widely uh, to a lot of my colleagues, including ones that aren't in, in clinical medicine. But this idea of that eventually things are going to kind of settle down, we'll see a decline, a sustained decline, and we could probably start getting back to some activities. But I don't know that we can get back to all activities, you know, uh, uh, and uh, particularly the kind of things that happen on a college campus or, you know, happen in the United States in the summer. Um, that's going to be a, a difficult thing unless we find out the denominator is really high. Right. And, and that the serology is helpful in telling yeah, us. Yeah. You know. But if we find out it's 5% and not 50%, it's going to be difficult. And there'll probably be some element of social distancing. You know, the masks may, may help. And, and then just this adherence to really good hygiene and hand washing. I mean, you know, I think a lot of other things are going to probably go away because of, of hand hygiene, both in the hospital and outside. But um, I'm hopeful that, you know, we might get something closer to normal, maybe within, uh, within maybe four weeks. That's just a guess. Um, what, um, what strikes you when you walk into the hospital? Um, it, um, uh, there's not as much joy. It's, you know, and I, and I don't mean to say that in a disparaging way because I think people are really doing their very best, but there are not that many people here. You know, they're not like families and kids, like it's really the bare minimum and everyone has a mask on. Uh, I actually took mine off <laughs> to do this to do this interview, but I think it's it's sort of this bizarro world to me. Um, but you know that said, people are really working together. Um, they are there's this sort of barracks team mentality. Uh, people are trying to move and innovate in ways that seemed unthinkable. But it it feels strange in the hospital that there just isn't that that commotion and movement and and uh, buzz, if you will. For people who don't know, Preeti is the uh, editor of the Peace of My Mind section, which is 40 years old. We have a spe very special theme issue that she's done with uh, Jody Zelke that will be uh, published in a few weeks. It was planned well before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. <laughs> but, but Preeti is very, co very connected to the emotion and narrative of, of medicine. You know, when we, we talked over the weekend about other things that you had wanted to talk about, you mentioned, could we say a little bit about um, kind of post-acute pandemic life yeah. Uh, for yeah. patients and society? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so think? I think one thing to just point out with patients is that it's not like they come in, they get oxygen for a couple of days, and they'd like go back to being totally no normal. I think there's a quite a bit of debility that occurs, and there's a lot of weight loss that happens, you know, people don't have, they don't have a sense of smell. And so they're not interested in eating. It's hard to eat. It's hard to breathe. And so you know, people kind of leave here in, in a, in a different condition than they were. And so I think that that trajectory is going to be important, particularly in older adults, mm. or, you know, who could lose a lot of function quickly. Uh, the issues around how to safely discharge people to a nursing home for skilled care. And of course, Karen um, uh, Joint Maddox wrote that wonderful viewpoint. Yeah thinking about how we, we need to structure payment and, and uh, how, how we can structure this to really give people the rehab resources. Our PM&R colleagues are thinking about this and uh, they're chipping in and, and you know really trying to think about um, how do we get people back to their physical baseline. But you know the issue of, of sort of post-COVID life and what that's going to do, and you know I think about this a lot, not just for myself, but really through the eyes of my kids. And I, as, as you know, Howard, is, uh, my son is a student at Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter is uh, a high school student in, in Ann Arbor. 
And they seem to be tolerating it pretty well, which is good. But, you know, I think about them like, gosh, you know, when I was a sophomore in college, Michigan won the NCAA basketball tournament. It was like the best day ever. We were, you know, that that didn't even happen this year. Yeah. You know? So I think about, I mean, you know, in the end, like if health and well-being have to be the, the guiding principle, you know, maybe basketball isn't that important. But, you know, our connections to each other and how we interact and what we value. I mean, you know, maybe it'll all become stronger. But we think about the loneliness, the social isolation that already plagues us and that it's it's been you know, it's been intensified. And I, I think about the incredible human cost of this. Yeah, I, I'm worried about, I, I've been struck by uh, how long people may remain skittish about being in large groups. You know, all, all those events that were planned, weddings, uh, 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 other events, will people even in J June or July and August really be skittish about having them, regardless of what the the governors recommend or, or, or don't recommend, you know, when, when people go into stores in July and August, assuming things are better, will people really be shy? Particularly, I, I think for the first time, this has really f uh, affected such a huge number of the elderly population in terms of being at risk. You know, I looked up, um, you know, we get a lot of viewpoints that said, you know, this is, you know, the worst uh, pandemic in, in the history of modern man. And um, you know, 700,000 people in the U.S. have died from HIV AIDS. And, and I looked back at the early years um, to, to understand how many people were dying from HIV AIDS. And for a few of the earlier years, it, it was between 20 and 40,000 a year were dying. Um, so I think for people who live through that, um, they will say, oh, we, we've faced things like this before. But that was in a very circumspect population. I think this is different in the sense of touching this touches every person living in the United States in a way that yeah. HIV AIDS didn't. So I think there is a difference. Um, I've been talking to Preeti Milani. Uh, Preeti is an associate uh, editor. She oversees a piece of my mind column. She oversees all of our infectious disease content. I have to say this year she's been fortunate. Our Fishbine fellow is Angel Desai. Preeti's been awfully busy and has been, uh, Angel's been in incredibly helpful. Uh, Preeti is uh, chief health officer for the University of Michigan, uh, professor of medicine. Preeti, thanks for joining me today. Thanks and so much for having me. Now, you've done a triptych, and I was trying to figure out when you put up four pa four paintings in a row what it's called. I'll, I'll figure it out, but I, I think yeah. you, you and Carlos will be back for another round in about a month or six weeks. That's right. All right. We will. Thanks, we will. Preeti. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Thank you. You too.